Okay, so uh, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. So I'm Charles Small, I'm the director of ISGAP, and it's really, it's a privilege that uh, Rafi Kohn Almagor is here. He's an expert on many subjects, including multiculturalism, but also issues of hate on the internet. So we're really grateful that Rafi's here. Rafi is also a research scholar with ISGAP and a professor at Hull University. But I'm going to turn it over to Daphne Kleinman, who's one of our colleagues at ISGAP, who's going to run the seminar. So Daphne, over to you and everybody welcome. And thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Charles. So hello, everyone. Today we have the pleasure of having Rafi with us. He's a doctor in philosophy from Oxford University, and he's a professor in chair in politics at the University of Hull. Um, his webinar today will be um, about taking hate seriously, the scope and the challenge of hate speech on the internet. Um, so Rafi, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Um, I'm going to speak about hate on, on the internet. And uh, the way that I'm going to construct the lecture, I'm going to start with a definition of, of hate speech say something about the methodology behind the research, uh, explain the problem of line drawing, meaning uh, what speech is kosher, is legitimate, and when it becomes not kosher, when it becomes illegitimate, and then uh, we can consider maybe uh, to, to bar or to ban this kind of speech. I'm going to explain that hate speech is a significant issue, significant problem, that uh, involves harm, harm, real harm real, to people. And I'm going to speak about boundaries to free speech and the connection between hate speech and hate crimes. And I think that at the end, if I'll have the time, I'm going to speak about remedies and a practical proposal as how to tackle hate on the internet. The main argument that I would like to, to make is that socially responsible people should not stand idly by while others are abusing freedom of expression to discriminate and victimize their targets for hate. There's no one unified definition of hate speech is a contested uh, term with many, many definitions. I would like to offer my definition of hate speech. Um, hate speech is defined as a biased, motivated, hostile, malicious speech aimed at a person or a group of people because of some of the actual or perceived innate characteristics. Hate speech expresses discriminatory, intimidating, disapproving, antagonistic, and or prejudicial attitudes toward those characteristics, which include sex, race, religion, ethnicity, color, national origin, disability, or sexual orientation. Hate speech is aimed to injure, dehumanize, harass, intimidate, debase, degrade, and victimize the targeted groups, and to foment insensitivity and brutality against the target groups. So that's the definition and the aim of hate speech. I want to say something about um, the methodology behind this project, this research project. This is not an easy topic uh, because of two reasons. One is that many of the hate sites are floating. So at one point there will be uh, an identified website in certain location on the web, and then it will just disappear. It will move to another place. Um, so the, the website addresses that keep changing. Of course, there are some that are constant like uh, Stormfront, but many small ones, they, they keep changing the closing it's like a sort of a uh, cat and mouse sort of a um, game between uh, hate mongers and those who do not like hate mongers. They keep changing. And secondly, it's not an easy subject because we are talking about very sensitive issues. And we are talking about highly charged and very offensive terms. It's simply uncomfortable to read the descriptions uh, that appear on these hate sites. They're extremely bad. The adjectives that are used are awful. And I spend many hours browsing uh, dozens of hate sites, um, looking at them, and uh, I'm going to inform you some of the findings 
I'm going to quote directly from the websites because I believe that you need to understand how bad it is. And it's always good to see who is the enemy and to understand how terrible these things are. Of course, I'm not intending to offend you, my audience. What I want is to accentuate the seriousness of hate speech. So if you feel that uh, you're not up to it, I'm not talking about cooking or I'm not talking about pleasantries or about the weather. I'm talking about serious stuff that is highly offensive, highly charged. So if you're not up to it, please leave now. I certainly do not want to offend you. What I would like to say is these words you can see, they can offend very deeply and they can harm. And these words, they can lead to action, vile action against the victims, against the, the target groups. What is legitimate and what is not a legitimate speech is not a simple thing to, to define. What I would regard as legitimate, others may regard as illegitimate. Liberals, especially American liberals who believe in the First Amendment, they would argue that really vicious statements are still legitimate, legitimate in terms of that we should not bar them, we should not outlet them. I mean, they're, of course, they're terrible. But liberals would say that statements like Jews are money hungry, gays are immoral, abortionists are murderers, Israel is an apartheid state, the N-words should return to Africa and calls to boycott Israel are on unpleasant yet legitimate speech. Meaning that liberals, as I said, American liberals especially, they would not argue that this kind of expression should be barred. On the other hand, calls that incite violence against target groups fall under the definition of incitement and incitement is illegal even in the land of the free. So even in the United States, the land of the First Amendment, they do not allow incitement. But how you define incitement, that's now the issue. So let me take an example, and I don't have time to look at hundreds of cases because there are hundreds of cases. I want to speak out about this particular case, Juari versus Wilson. And why Juari versus Wilson is so important because to the best of my um, knowledge, this was the first time that an American court in the land of the free declared that a certain website should be shut down. This is a very extreme measure that Americans do not like to do. They dread doing this. So I think it was the first time that this kind of uh, order took place and the year was 2000. Now, why that particular website Married closure. Here you see Miss Juari and you see her daughter. Um, Miss Juari came to the attention of a guy by the name Ryan Wilson, who really did not like Juari. Why he didn't like her? Um, he didn't like her because she had affairs with African Americans as a result of one of the affairs, um, her child was born, the lady, the, the, the lady girl that you've seen before. And Ms. Juari herself was working in the housing office in the municipality in Pennsylvania. And working for housing um, agency mean, meant that she was helping poor people. And so it happens that in the United States, many poor people happen to be African-American. So Mitchell did two things that Mr. Wilson did not like. She engaged in sexual relationship in African America, which is absolute no no, because she's contaminating the, the white race. And then even worse than that, she's helping African Americans for fair housing. So she became a target to, to Mr. Wilson. Uh, Mr. Wilson was a leader of a small, not very important. Um, white supremacist group called Alpha HQ, which had a website. And um, he decided she's going to be the star of this website. So when you enter into the website on the, on the first page, you see a picture of Miss Juari. 
and uh, you see uh, uh, in the office and when you click enter in order to uh, enter the website there was a picture of a bomb and the bomb explode and of course together with Ms. Juari in the office and when he went to the next page it would say something like traitors like this should be be aware for in our day they will hung from the neck from the nearest tree or lamppost and then it explains all the scenes of Ms. Juari and why she deserved this kind of stuff. The daughter was described as mongrel, and um, it also listed various types of guns, information where to obtain various weapons, and provided a bomb recipe under the picture of Juari's office. So according to the court, um, this was a clear incitement because it explains the scenes of Miss Juari. It tells exactly what ha should happen to her, instructs um, where she can be found. So it gave uh, the details of her office, uh, office phone number, the details of her house, her home, um, um, gave the photo, photos of her, of her, of her daughter, um, and then provided instructions how to kill by guns, by, by weapons, by bombs, and so on. So that was regarded as a clear incitement. We saw a charge by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Attorney General with threats, harassment, and ethnic intimidation. The site was removed from the internet, um, and the court issued an injunction against the defendant, Ryan Wilson, and his organization of HQ, barring them from displaying certain messages on the internet. So that was an important precedent that was set in uh, Jurari versus Wilson. So now I would like to speak about the boundaries. So how you define the boundaries? What are the tools? What are the criteria that will help us to understand that there are some speeches that will be described as advocacy or preaching, which are kosher, which are legitimate, where the others that are incitement or instigation and so on. So, the ideas behind the, um, the, the drawing of the boundaries stem from philosophy of, uh, of a philosopher by the name John Stuart Mill, an English philosopher who lived in London in the 19th century, who wrote a book called On Liberty. And On Liberty was um, sort of a, a celebration of liberty. It is about the need to have freedom, all kinds of freedom, celebration of freedom, Mill was a champion of freedom. And the entire book, there were two parts, two small segments in which he spoke about the boundaries to free speech. So just to tell you what the agenda was, the agenda was very clear. Free speech is the agenda, not limitation of free speech. And one of the things that uh, um, provided insight as when to uh, bar speech was an example that he gave about a corn dealer um, a corn dealer would like to exploit uh, people of the public. So let's say that, um, you know, usually there is a certain margin of profit of 4%. This greedy uh, corn dealer is setting on 7%, uh, which means that people are very hungry and very angry because, you know, the diet of many people was on, on bread, corn, and, and, and potatoes. So if you are rising, raising the, the price of bread, Significantly, people just, you know, uh, going to starve. So he said, just to mention that there is a mob outside of the corn dealer house. And in this kind of excitement, and I don't know how many of you have been to a protest ever, but when you are in protest, you are not only yourself, you are carried on a public around you. Um, and you lose control over the things, you become agitated. And when there is a heated atmosphere, and then someone rises and say, okay, let's go and kill this man, this bastard, because he is exploiting us, it might be the case that this kind of a call in that kind of circumstances would lead people to go on the house, to burn it down, and to kill the corn dealer. John Stormill tells us, this is an absolute no-no. This is something that you should not say, you should not do. This is incitement. And Mill was the first one 
to make a distinction between advocacy and incitement. Advocacy is fine, incitement is not. From this example that uh, made a lot of effect on the Western world, I'm not talking about only on philosophers and political scientists, but also justices of Supreme Courts all over the Western world, that gave us an idea what we need to, to have, what kind of criteria we need to have in order to define incitement. So one thing is assured, the content of the speech should be very, very harmful, very damaging. And secondly, we are speaking about circumstances that are going to lead here and now to action. So if the same statement would be, I don't know, four miles away from the corn dealer house, liberals would say, this is not going to constitute incitement because that they might be mitigating circumstances. Until this mob is going to go to the corn dealer house, many things can happen. The corn dealer may hear, may hear that, you know, they're approaching and they leave the home. The police may hear and they come and, and disturb the, the mob, the demonstration, the, the protest or defend, protect the, the, the corn dealer. Um, rain can start, snow can start. I mean, there'll be dozens of scenarios that can happen that are going to mitigate the circumstances. So the circles have to be here and now. These are the most important criteria, and this is why they're blinking. The content of the speech and the circumstances that are ripe for violence. And then there's other that we need to examine, but even in the absence, um, it might be the case that it can be still certain speech and incitement. So the manner of speech, how you say that is important, and the intention of the speaker are very, very important. Why manner is important? I'll give an example. So imagine the corn dealer house and the mob outside, and I'm going to say exactly the same words twice. The first time, okay, fellows, now let's go and storm this house, burn it down, and kill this bastard. And now I'm going to say, okay, fellows, let's go and storm this house burn it down and kill the bastard. Well, you know, the first time, the first time that I said that, this is motivating. And the second time, you know, somebody's gonna say, hey, you know, just shut up, okay? So the manner of speech can be very important in mobilizing people to action. Intention is also important. And we know that in, in criminal law, if you are saying something and it's known that you are saying racist, and you are motivated by racism, then the act that you are going, that you are doing, if you're caught, it's going to be tenfold in terms of the punishment that you're going to receive. So if someone says, my intention is to kill this, this guy, it's one thing, but we know that certain politicians are careful enough not to declare their intentions. So I'm saying we have to examine all four criteria but two of them are very, very important, the content and the circumstances. The manner we need to examine, the speaker's intention we need to examine, but even in the absence, it might be the case that a certain speech would be considered as incitement. Second case that I'm going to speak about, I think the last time, the, the last one that I'm going to speak today is the Machado case. So Mr. Machado was a student at Irvine University in California. And he noticed that there are too many people around him that are Asians. And Mr. Machado is white, he doesn't like Asians. He wants them out. So he goes out and collects emails of 60 something Asian students on Irvine. And he sent them this email, this vile email in which he threatened their lives and tells them that if they are not going to go out of Eva and just disappear, he's going to kill them. Um, and this is an absolute no-no. And here you had, you had victims, identified victims, 60 something of them. And Mr. Machado said exactly what he intends to do to them if they're not going to flee. He was charged for incitement and he was ejected from the university. He was out uh, uh, under house arrest for, for a year. 
and uh, his, his career was ruined. Again, if you, if you have direct target and you have clear intentions and you voice what intentions are and your intentions are vile and the speech is vile, then this is incitement. So hate speech is fuzzier than incitement. It's somewhere between advocacy and incitement. It's fuzzier than incitement and is far more damaging than advocacy. Advocacy is legitimate, there's no problem with that. But hate speech is not exactly incitement, it's something below that. Hate speech creates a virulent atmosphere of double victimization. The speakers are under attack, they are misunderstood, they are marginalized, they are delegitimized, um, and they believe that powerful forces, either governments or some sort of conspiracies, they depict in the, in the eyes. And the answer to the problem is the victimization of the target group. That's what hate speech uh, does. And if they're able to victimize the target, then they themselves will have their salvation. What are the relevant factors? Even if you're published on, on the internet, we can discern that it's not going to be, I mean, liberals try to look at everything universalist in a universal way, but it's not the case. We know that there are certain factors that are going to play a part and they will differentiate between one country to another. So one factor that is very important in history, for instance, um, Holocaust denial. Germans and Israelis are far more sensitive to Holocaust denial than British and American. And for obvious reasons. So history does play a part. Culture. United States, the land of the free, is willing to legitimize almost everything. Whereas other cultures, say again Israel, or even Canada, just across the border from the United States, their culture, the distinguish and, and highlight the issue of multiculture, multiculturalism, they will be far more sensitive than Americans to certain types of, of harm, of, of free speech. Morality is important, is a more moral consideration. And you know that liberal countries tend to have standards of morality that are different than say uh, the standards in Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia. And of course, law, law is important. There are some countries that have hate speech laws. I think about 50 countries around the world or something like that. And many other countries don't have hate speech laws, but law of course makes a difference. If a law decides that uh, certain speech is not allowed, then it's not allowed, notwithstanding whether you would like to legitimize or not, whether you are liberal or not, it doesn't really matter, it's against the law. All these are very, very important factors when we move um, from one country to another. So it's not that there is one internet and one universal standard, that's not the case. It's going to be different standards in different countries. Now we'd like to say something about racism, the phenomenon of, of racism. There are thousands of racist and hateful sites, unfortunately. Um, but it's not really matter how many um, sites are there. I would say that the quality of the site is far more important. So the most notorious sites for very good reasons is Stormfront. Uh, one of the first website on the internet established in 1994, so in early days of the internet. And uh, it claims to have any given time between 100,000 to 150,000 followers, um, members, people who subscribe or interested in, in Stormfront. So one website, um, it, the value of the quality of it is in terms of propagating hate is far more important than hundreds of, of very small websites that are not making much of, the, of a difference. Video games are of, of very, a lot of importance uh, nowadays um, because this kind of people who go to the, this kind of websites, they spend hours and hours on the internet and they like to play games. And uh, some of the games are very, very popular among that clientele. So I'll mention some few of them. Uh, I'm not sure whether all of them exist, but at one point or another, there were best sellers uh, among that cluster of the population, hate mongers. So ethnic cleansing uh, players would go and kill black and Hispanic people in order to gain access to the subway where Jews are hiding. Border patrol 
um, you get points for shooting down immigrants trying to cross the border. Shoot the blacks, uh, self-explanatory. Blast away the darkies as they appear, an excellent little shooter style game. Nazi wolf 3D uh, when you are the Nazi and you are hunting down Jews. Zog's nightmare, uh, anti-Zionist uh, game uh, in which again, you, you kill Zionists. KZ uh, manager Millennium. So you are the manager of Auschwitz or Auschwitz-like uh, concentration death camp. And of course you brutalize um, your inmates, your prisoners. Another phenomenon that is prevalent among uh, racist and hate mongers is homeschooling. Um, homeschooling is popular because if hate monger sends his son or daughter to just a regular school, they are going to be manipulated by the Zionist propaganda, so-called, because Jews are all over the place and Jews control the education system in the United States and other education systems. So you should not allow them to educate our children. So the best way to have control uh, and to make sure that our children are going to have the right education, the education that they need is if, we, if they remain at home and be educated at home by us who know better and we understand how dangerous it is to send them to schools. So that's um, a statement by the son of the founder of Stormfront. Derek, I am 15 years old. I used to be in a public school. It is a shame how many white minds are wasted in that system. I'm now in homeschool. I'm no longer attacked by gangs or non-whites of non-whites. I spend most of my day learning instead of tutoring the slowest kids in my class. In addition to my schoolwork, I'm also learning pride in myself, my family and my people. By the way, the same Derek later on uh, changed his mind about his upbringing and about his father and about uh, the white race and so on. And now he's a propagandist for tolerance and reconciliation and equality between races. But there are plenty of people who are still homeschooled and they get the right values by these hate mongers. So Don Black uh, established uh, Stormfront, 1995, I said 1994, mistake 1995. And Black said, the internet is that opportunity we've been looking for. We never were able to reach the audience that we can now so easily and inexpensively um, um, can get. By 1997, Black site became home of the webpage of other extremists such as Aryan Nations and, and others. Um, for many years, um, there was a website called martinlutherking.org. And uh, in the United States, many kids have to write an essay about Martin Luther King. And this website was available to them. And, you know, kids go and serve the internet. And from the first page, you wouldn't know that it's a hate site. Only as you go deeper into the site and you read more, then you understand how insidious uh, this site was and uh, depicting Martin Luther King not as a human rights activist, but as, a, as an enemy of the state, more or less. A bad, bad person with really bad qualities. And it took a while until it was possible to, to remove this because Americans don't like to shut down websites. It was active and polluted many, many brains before uh, uh, it was shut down. So what are the main principles of hate mongers? Of course, there are the first champions of the First Amendment. Uh, they live by free speech. They adore free speech. So they will be the best advocates of the First Amendment. The First Amendment allows them to flourish. They will depict the, the world in black and white colors. It's us versus them. And whites are the oppressed group. You didn't know that? Well, come to the world of the of these people, uh, they believe that the whites are the oppressed group and have to fight for the rights because their society is in danger of being overrun by ignorant people who are loving welfare uh, state and support minorities. Um, and these minorities, African Americans, others, they desire white men, women and they pollute our race. 
So I'm going now to quote directly from some of these websites, and I want to warn you, it's not a pleasant research and it's not a pleasant result. Um, the language is vile and highly offensive. So who are the targets? Well, the first targets are the African-Americans. They are depicted as the enemy. Um, they are described by pejorative and derogative words like brutal, primitive, biologically inferior. Their presence represents a corrosive element for the whole American society. They bring the jungle culture that they brought from Africa into America. The culture clashes with the ethnic, civil, and economic superiority of the whites, and they destroy and undermine the American nation. The second hated group on the net are the homosexuals. They are portrayed as seeking to sexually trap young white males. Um, their behavior is contradictory to nature, perverted, sinful, morally abominable, allegedly threatening to undermine the religious values of the white community. Homosexuals do not reproduce and thus threaten the survival of their own race. They are said to spread contagious and deadly diseases and uh, no less than angels of death. This is something that started in the 1980s during the uh, HIV hype um, and it still lingers on. Hate mongers argue that gay people should be no less hunted down in the same way witches were once hunted in Europe. One of the most hated group um, are the conspirators. And if you, did, you didn't know what the conspirators are, well, these are the Jews. The Jews are allegedly situated in power position in society. They are allegedly united by a secret pact. This is comes from the elders of Zion, if you know uh, this tract of the 19th century that came from, from uh, Russia. So there's a secret pact and they set in motion a global conspiracy to control and rule the world. Jews are money hungry, they are exploitative, they are ugly, and they are no less the human pollution. They allegedly lie in order to achieve the aims and are successful in brainwashing the minds of Christian Americans. They control everything. All the power points uh, of society are controlled by Jews. Academia, media, banks, MTV, feminist, television, Hollywood, they have it. They control everything, the press. There are sites that educate you how Jews look like, how you recognize the power, how they control America and how they control the world. Zog is Zionist occupied government. And if you didn't know that, the White House, of course, is Zog, is controlled by Zionists. The fourth most hated group on the internet are the Muslims. Islam is associated with backwardness, intolerance, violence, and terrorism. Islamophobia depicts all Muslims as fundamentalists and terrorists. Um, an extensive Islamophobic network disseminates misinformation, fear and prejudice about Islam, and incite hatred against Muslims. How do they use the internet, hate mongers? Well, they use it like us. Uh, in many respects, they provide information in many languages, and they suit the, the, the language according to the audience. They facilitate um, the internet for their travel, for communication, to find information. They seek legitimacy for their ideas because luckily for us, they're, they're a minority and it's not nice for them to feel alone. So they seek legitimacy, they create their own networks and their own socialization. They promote their ideas through propaganda. They use camera, they use chat rooms, they use videos. They seek support for their actions and for their beliefs. They socialize and motivate, they use chat rooms and create virtual uh, community, they invite each other for retreats um, of the right race in which they, they drink, they dance, uh, they uh, shoot, uh, and they do all their activities on these retreats. Music is extremely powerful sort of a tool. Uh, we know the powerful music. I mean, we all, most of us like music very much. They have their own music and music is a, is a wonderful tool to propagate their ideas and the rock bands, uh, heavy metal bands uh, with vicious, very racist uh, lyrics and vicious uh, music, vicious games, I mentioned them already. They link uh, the groups, uh, so, you know, in all corners of the world together. 
They promote violence. They provide instructions in online manuals about violence and how to create violence. They plan the meetings, activities, and coordinations. They raise cash for the activities and they recruit members, new members, because they need to provide new blood for the activities. Now, all this, why it's so important that we be aware and fight against this? Because there is a strong link between speech and action. When the speech is passing the line and become insightful, then it may lead to violence. So I mentioned there are just a few incidents, uh, Benjamin Smith, Richard Henry Bermers, uh, James uh, Van Brun, they all um, were not only um, using, well, the people who are looking for propaganda, they were propagandists themselves, not only consumer, but people propagate this kind of, of propaganda. And then it's at one point, they bypassed, they became so convinced in the old rhetoric that they went on shooting sprees and kill people. And they used to visit these hate sites and palm themselves. Smith, for instance, says it wasn't really till I got on the internet, read some literature of these groups that I, it really all came together. He became convinced that that's what needs to, to be done. Um, Buford Four killed one person, injured five others in 1999. Uh, same year, Matthew and Tyler Williams met a gay couple and set fire to three Sacramento synagogues. Keith Luke in 2009 murdered two black people and raped and nearly killed a third. All were active on hate sites. I think the tipping point, really a, a very important incident was in 2011, because I've been following uh, these um, groups for many, many years. I started my research in 1985 and I witnessed how they evolved uh, across the world and there was a strong link, I would say, between hate speech and hate crime. But Breivik, what he did in 2011, he brought the phenomena into new horizons. So now we can see after Breivik, the connection between hate speech, hate crime, and terrorism. Because with Breivik, it's not only hate crime, it's on a very different scale. This guy murdered single-handedly 69 people uh, in two locations in Norway. And after him, we can see more and more shooting sprees. Um, so now it's even aggravated sort of um, danger uh, between hate speech, hate crime, and terrorism. So 2012, Jason Todd already killed with, uh, four people. Um, the same month, uh, Newman, um, was accused of torturing and dismembering a Chinese immigrant. 2018, mass shooting at synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 11 people were killed and six wounded. March 2019, the white supremacist uh, terrorists murdered 51 people and injured 40 more in the Al Nur Mosque and the Linwood Islamic Center in, in Christchurch, New Zealand. The terrorists had been radicalized to believe in a great replacement, a white nationalist conspiracy theory that claims that white population are being purposefully replaced with often Muslim immigrants. Again, Breivik, um, who wrote a, a very vicious manuscript um, detailing how the others are doing this and threatening us. So this is a concrete and real danger. What can we do? So here's the last part of my lecture in which I'm going to propose remedies. So we identified as a a significant problem that deserve a solution. And I propose different solutions. And I would think that given that there are differences of history, culture, morality, and law, which I mentioned, I think different countries are going to adopt different remedies. So speech versus speech is the American favorite uh, proposal a remedy. Uh, you have to fight speech with more speech, but sometimes it's not enough. Education, of course, is very, very important. And there are all kinds of programs, for instance, Partners Against Hate, uh, that is an important program in the, United, in the United States. We need to promote tolerance, tolerance of everything. We need to expose hate when we see that. If we just let hate pass, this is what evil needs in order to thrive, silent people. So we need to expose hate and we need to, um, to 
call it out and, and to warn against it. There are organizations and, and websites that do hate watch, that alert against manifestation of hate uh, speech on the internet. There are citizens' initiatives to combat hate, like Coloradans United Against Hate, Hatred, for instance, in the United States, in Colorado. There are initiatives against hate, and for, for instance, on social networks like Facebook. For instance, one of the Facebook sites is United Against Hate that appears on Facebook. That's a, um, um, a group that fights against hate. We need to try to deny them legitimacy. And for this, we need to have more sensitive media coverage of hate. We need to ban clear racist parties, do not allow them to run to parliaments. And we need to protect vulnerable people. One of the things that liberal democracy should and must do is to protect vulnerable populations. We have to have culture of tolerance and we have to ensure that the ISPs, the inter intermediaries are responsible for providing this kind of platform. They should be aware of what they're doing and make a decision whether they want to have a, pl a platform for hate. We have to have channels for user complaints. We have to omit or at least label hate websites from search engines, labeling, naming, and shaming of websites and those who host websites. And if all this is not enough, then some countries uh, opted for law. So legal means prosecutions of, of hate mongers. When you're talking about young people, parental supervision is uh, recommended, filters are recommended and there are filters against hate, um, blocking programs in at home and in schools, publishing overviews and reports on regular basis of manifestation of hate, business ban of businesses who do uh, business with hate sites and hate mongers, international cooperation between governments as well as between governments and internet service providers, for instance, working group on internet governance, um, Jürgen Jatz in Germany, um, Magneta in Netherlands, International Network Against Cyber Hate. All these organizations are international organizations that fight against hate. I also would like to mention all these um, international covenants that are promote tolerance and against hatred. Uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant Convention on Elimination for All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and so on. All of these are important uh, covenants, but of course it's important that we are going to put some content, content and context and enforcement into them. Otherwise, they're not going to uh, be very, very um, significant. I suggest in, in, in my book, Confronting the Internet's Dark Side, that it should be a browser that is going to filter hatred. I call it clean net, meaning that it's going to be network that is going to be clean of hatred and terrorism and uh, hate mongering. I follow Jürgen Habermas um, theory of deliberate democracy. And I suggest that there will be some sort of machinery that is going to organize clean net um, as, as, a, as, a, as a filter uh, of such things. What I'm proposing is those who originated the internet, they had in mind the vision of a free highway. I would like to propose a vision of social responsibility. I think that we need to balance one against the other, two very, very important values, free speech on the one hand and social responsibility on the other. And finding the balance is the task that we, we, we do need to have. So what we have here, um, a global problem, and because it's global, it requires a global solution. We need to speak about social responsibility of all stakeholders, of the user, of the reader, of the internet intermediaries, of countries, governments, and international communities. We have to discuss the issue of filters and to what extent we believe in them and we would like to enforce them. We would like to encourage proactive NGOs that are going to uh, fight um, against hatred and put forward the motion of corporate social responsibility that businesses have a stake here. They flourish because they operate into in the realm of liberal democracy. They don't want to undermine it, but these people, they undermine liberal democracies. So we need to speak about the role of the state. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Rafi. That was very interesting. Um, really, really fascinating and important topic. I'm going to go through the chat really quickly and read some of our questions from our viewers. So um, Eric asks, how do you think hate is being promoted by actions in the UN where Israel is constantly and often singled out for condemnation, yet countries more vocal expressing um, for expressing hate of Israel are also the most notorious on their human rights abuses and ignored? I don't think this is the topic that I talked about. I spoke about hate on the internet, not uh, yeah. hate in the UN. So I don't think but it's, it's really um, relevant. But a lot of NGOs, I think, picking back off this question, a lot of NGOs like um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, they promote these values on the internet. So, Yeah, I would oppose any, any form of hatred against Israel, against others. I'm against hate, period. I'm against any form of hatred. Somebody, let me look. Um, we have a question by Mohammed Halil, and he asks if you believe that anti-Semitism is related to popular culture, and if you believe that hate speech on the internet will stop. My short answer, no, I don't believe in that. I think that hate is, uh, is here to stay, unfortunately, and this is why it's very important that we call it out. It's very important that we, we become aware of the problem. We become aware of how significant it is. And I said that for me, Breivik is, um, is a watershed because from then on, we see um, manifestation of hate that not only lead to sporadic um, hate crimes, but to acts of terrorism. So this is a significant problem and we have to fight against this. No, I don't think that hate is going to, to disappear very soon. And it's not only hatred against Jews. As I said, there are four different groups that are mainly on the internet and all four of them attract a lot of attention, unfortunately, a lot of hate. But that means that we need to work harder and we need to be attentive to this. And the first step is awareness. And the second step, okay, so what are we going to do about this? Um, and the third step is to ask what stakeholders and what are these stakeholders are willing to do in order to fight hatred. I am baffled by internet organization that say, well, it's not really up to me. These are the people who spread uh, hatred. I have nothing to do with that. But you provide a platform for that, what guys say. Why do you do that? Um, so as long as um, internet intermediaries are going to hide beyond the fact that they are just, you know, providing a platform and it's all about free speech, then we are going to, we are assisting hate to spread. We are, we are assisting hate propaganda. So I am putting a lot of pressure. I am putting a lot of emphasis on the role of internet intermediaries. And I would like us to understand that we can influence this. We can make them understand that they have a huge responsibility here and they have to weigh and balance between free speech and social responsibility. So we have another question um, from Heather, and she just wants to know how did you go about conducting your research? Um, she said that in her experience to access um, hate speech from groups, you need to join websites. So she's just curious about how you got this information. No, you, you don't have to join a website to many of the websites. I mean, in order to join the chat room, you need to identify yourself, but I didn't. I did not do that. I didn't. I didn't join any 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 chat room. Um, so I just served the internet. I just served the internet, and I found it. It was quite easy to to find the, the website. I don't think it's a major problem. Uh, so you don't have to register. So I don't. Uh, um, I don't uh, uh, suggest to anybody to use all kind of uh, pseudonym or, or deception and so on. I, I, I refrain from doing this and uh, I could conduct my research without doing this. It is possible. Um, we have another question that is um, basically trying to understand the line between reading a statement 
women and so the example they gave is that a woman read the Quran and was uh, convicted for hate speech because of the contents of the Quran. So how do you separate um, just the fact versus a person spewing hate on the internet? Well, this is this is what I said about uh, the difference between uh, legitimate speech and, and incitement. Um, and incitement is something that is barred all over the world, all over the Western world. Um, hate speech, I said, is fuzzier than that. So hate speech is something that uh, is more to the discretion of internet intermediaries. It's um, it's not it, it's foggy. It's blurred sort of uh, boundaries. And this is the problem they have, because they, some of them would say this is free speech and others would say, well, yeah, but it's dangerous speech. So I said, at least let's let, let us agree that when it comes to incitement, you do something about that. That would be our starting point, because unfortunately. I found also incitement on the net, so I found that there will be uh, clear targets of hatred and at the same website there will be instructions on how to kill and this is incitement so let's start with the clear cases and once we clear the clear cases from the internet then we can move to the more debatable cases but i would say this is going to be far more tricky as long as we are living in the world in which the major internet intermediaries are american because they believe in the first amendment um I'm not going to be around, I think, in another 30, 40 years, uh, but then maybe it will be a very true, very different reality because I think that then possibly the internet is going to control by Chinese people and their standards of free speech are a bit different. So it's going to be a different new world. I'm not sure whether it's going to be better or worse, but it's going to be very, very different, I would say. Yeah, um, I think those are all the questions we have so far. Um, again, I encourage everyone to submit more questions. I have a few more minutes. Um, so if you'd like, you can still submit a question in the chat. Um, I think this is it for now. Oh, Seema has a question, so I'll actually unmute. Seema, I've, I've asked you to unmute. Thank you. Uh, very good presentation, Professor Almogo. I would like to ask you, maybe just a, a broader overview, would you describe the level of hate speech and conspiracy theories and extremism on the net today as reaching the point on the level to almost insurrection level inside democracies? And would you say that democracies today are not equipped to dealing with this kind of phenomena? I think democracies are equipped um, to deal with this phenomena. It's not a question of, of ability, it's a question of will. Um, I don't think that technology as such is a problem. Um, you know, I, I, when I did my research, the majority of research as I, I was doing in the United States, and I was fortunate uh, to be um, in Washington, where a place, uh, the Woody Wilson Center, where there was many, many people who would like to be associated with, with, with Wilson. So I had an access to um, really top people uh, in technology in the US. And I asked them, is this a question of ability or is it a question of will? And all of them told, all of them, without any exception, all of them told me it's a question of will, it's not a question of ability. Because for any kind of product, you can find the counter product. That's not a problem. It's like a arms race, you know, it's one after the other. It is just a question of will, and the Americans have uh, difficulties in restricting speech. That's not part of their psyche. That's not part of of the composition of the culture and and where they they. That's not the system of belief that they have. They really truly believe in free speech. That's something that they start, I think, in the kindergarten. So they um, they would allow things to to. Um, take force and take move and and uh, like a snowball um, becoming very, very powerful. And they're going to notice there's a problem when it's too late, when people are killed. And they are not going to stop before that. So that's that's the, the, the paradox of incitement. They, you recognize incitement, especially in the United States, only after the effect, only when someone died, 
then you start to recall, hey, actually it was an incitement. How come I didn't see that? Um, that's the problem, Sima. So it's yeah. the problem is not that we don't we don't have the tools. We have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the ability, but um, Americans are very reluctant to to go that way. Um, that's now in the United States, uh, we've seen what happens when we when you have powerful people who are instigating violence. We saw how it ended. It's extremely dangerous. It's very very dangerous. Uh, because now we are not talking about just, you know, John Smith from the KKK who say something. Now it's the president of the United States who say something. And, uh, uh, and these words can be very, very harmful. Terribly harmful. So we need to be conscious about this. I say the, the first step is awareness. You have to understand the power of the world. And then we can do something about mitigating this power of the world. And the idea is to balance one against the other free speech and social responsibility. Think about the consequences of your words. Where, where does it going to lead? And if people are going to think in this way of speech versus responsibility, maybe we're going to have a different sort of uh, behavior and conduct on the internet, not only by, by users, but more so by internet intermediaries because they have the power. Yeah, just to qualify what I meant, I wasn't talking about capabilities, let alone technological capabilities, which we know we can uh, do things with. I was talking about the soft elements of democracy. This is especially the legacy, the, the uh, legislation, uh, you know, the, the history, uh, the values you believe in, uh, the uh, methodology of decision making and so and so. All those things are making democracies fail in dealing with hate speech more than other countries. By the way, you can see the difference between the United States and countries in Europe. In Europe, Germany, UK, they are dealing di differently uh, yeah. than in the US. So, but okay, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah, I, I think that I mentioned, that, that's what I meant, that uh, certain criteria that differentiate between one country and another. So I mentioned history, culture, morality, and law. And they are different from one country to another. Absolutely, you're right. Certainly, um, I'm, I said that hate mongers, they love free speech because free speech allows them to prosper. Um, they find it far more difficult to operate in places like Russia or North Korea because they will be crushed. These countries don't have any qualms to crush them when it doesn't suit the government. Uh, so of course democracy, this is what I call the catch of democracy that the very foundation of the system give rise to dangers against the system. Yeah. Rafi, can I, can I ask a question? Sure, okay. Charles. Go ahead. So, uh, could you comment on the work of Shushana Zuboff in her book on surveillance capitalism? No, where she's arguing that the social media giants are, in a sense, you speak about democracy, but I want to challenge you on your use of democracy. Zuboff is arguing that with sort of free market... Uh, the free market system and the rise of uh, social media and the internet and these social media giants that we humans are becoming commodities that are bought and sold everything we do everything we say is becoming a commodity and that the power <clears throat> the power of the citizen has become extraordinarily weakened in this new rapidly changing reality can you speak to zuboff's work and and when we speak about democracy and and the the rights of citizens what are the rights of citizens when these huge corporations are controlling and recording literally everything we do and say how does that fit into fighting free speech or, or fighting people who are out to harm citizens well I, I can't comment on something i didn't i did not read i did not read the zuba but uh, the arguments sounds marxist to me i mean that's what Marx said uh, about the commodities and making people into commodity and so on. Um, well, no, Mar Marx had a specific understanding of commodities, but uh, so she, I don't think she's a Marxist. She, she's a, at the business school at Harvard, so okay. it's an important. I don't know. I, don't know. I said it sounds. I, di I didn't read that. What it, certainly I agree that the major um, internet intermediaries, uh, Facebook, uh, Google. Um, they have 
far too much power. And uh, um, they just become um, blind to, to the responsibility they have um, in, in making billions of, of dollars. Um, so there's, there should be a way in which um, monopoly should, should be broken down uh, because it's not, good. it's not good for the world when you have this kind of power because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, Lord Acton said it before. So that, that's something that, you know, that's the only comment that I, I made. I agree then that they have too much power and uh, they have to uh, be reckoned with responsibility far more than they do. I agree to that. Thank I saw you. the name Mark Freeman before. Uh, if if yes. Mark's still there, he wants um, to speak. Yes. I, Mark, I've just asked for you to unmute yourself. Hi, Rafi. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Very good to see you, even uh, in these circumstances. I wanted to take you up on um, your, you, well, first of all, on uh, the idea that uh, Americans are so wedded to um, uh, free speech that it's very hard to do anything uh, uh, by way of regulation. Um, first of all, it's probably well for, for us to remember, and maybe for them to remember, I've forgotten which uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, said it, but uh, he said that uh, uh, you can't interpret the uh, Constitution as a suicide pact, lest it become one. So, uh, and that, this goes again to the definition of democracy. Any definition of uh, the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment that ends up uh, uh, defining the First Amendment as a tool to defeat democracy and uh, to defeat the ability of a democracy to defend itself against its enemies can't be an admissible uh, interpretation of the First Amendment. But uh, going beyond that, um, instead of uh, conceptualizing uh, the, the legal or the constitutional um, analysis in terms of incitement, which is the way people immediately go to it, why not uh, interpret it uh, in terms of other accepted forms of regulation, such as defamation or advertising to children or advertising dangerous products or false advertising or advertising how to make a bomb. Those are all ways that society legitimately regulates speech without incitement. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I said, you know, the, one of the core ideas that I try to to uh, say tonight is that um, this balancing between free speech and social responsibility. This is the idea behind social responsibility. And I think that uh, the Americans are, are very much hooked into the, the issue of free speech and didn't pay until now very close examination or reflection on what does it mean to have such power? What is the meaning of social responsibility? How it translates and so on. Um, that's something that I would like to press forward. And that's coincide, it comes to terms exactly with the comment that you are making. Uh, because if, if these giants would understand that uh, with power comes responsibility and with great power comes great responsibility, I think they would behave differently. But, you know, I've, I've been meeting these guys. I've been meeting with the Google people and the Facebook people and the Twitter people and so on. And I, I see that they really struggle with any suggestions that you, that you would like to, to, in their opinion, that you would like to, to limit free speech. They really struggle with that. It's not something, it's, uh, they're not acting. That, you know, I said that they, they, it comes with the milk with the mothers. You know, free speech is really enshrined value in, in the American psyche. I, I, didn't, I don't find it anywhere else in the world. I mean, I said that just across the border and you and I had many conversations about hate on the internet. Yeah. And we know that Canada took a very different stand. I mean, you took a very different stand when it came to hate mongers. And your stand is not popular in the United States. That's why Anna Zundel moved essentially eventually to Canada, to, to California, because it was easier for him to work there. Uh, you were not on his tail. 
Um, so we see that it's different, but I, I believe the Americans. I think there's something genuine about this. I'm just sorry that they never thought that the founders of the American Constitution did not believe in social responsibility to the extent that they believed in free speech. I'm really sorry about that. Because I think social responsibility is a great value, is it's no less important than free speech. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, this was an incredible lecture, Rafi. It, I think um, we should all really pay more attention to hate on the internet. And it'll be recorded on our website and it's any of their colleagues. And please join us on March 16th for our next lecture, Understanding Online Antisemitism Towards a New Linguistic Approach with Professor Matthias Jacob Becker. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good